Welcome to the Reality Revolution. This is your host, Brian Scott. And today's episode of the Reality Revolution podcast will focus on Neville Goddard's concept of using the imagination. I've done and delved on many different topics throughout the show. Lately, I've been focusing a lot on reality transurfing, and I will continue my deep dive on that. But I'm very, very fascinated by Neville Goddard's teachings. He was a profound teacher of reality creation. It is way more popular than reality transurfing. If you go on the channels and the boards, there is it just it's viral right now. When did you start hearing about Neville Goddard? Let me ask you that. It's very popular right now. Clearly, his message is resonating. It is, in my opinion, consistent completely with Abraham, the secret, the law of attraction, and reality transurfing. In fact, the specificity is very specific to reality transurfing. I have mentioned Neville Goddard many times before on the Reality Revolution, particularly his teaching, The Feeling is the Secret. If I was to summarize the two major important teachings of Neville Goddard, it would be his teaching on imagination and his teaching on the feeling being the secret, which is talked about in Transurfing, which is talked about in all of these circles, understanding that you can manifest through your feelings. And the way he explains his imagination technique to me is important with what we're currently talking about in reality Transurfing. I believe, and I really wanted to, with this podcast, find a way to access the space of variations. How can we access the space of variations? I asked the channeled entity, Oprah, in the last interview, if you get a chance to check that out, I asked, how can I create feelings? Can I access the space of variations just to, just to get information. And she had said that you have to become something to, to get access to it. I do believe that we can access the space of variations through our imagination. We're not creating something out of the blue. When we imagine something, the imagination is us accessing a version of the space of variations. So I want to develop our imagination ability where it's very similar to what we're already doing with the target slides and other things. But I think that I want to take a deeper approach and take a look at Neville Goddard. I think that we may learn some different f- ways of, it's just like cooking food and there's different ways of cooking a hamburger. Each of them are good. You know, this is a different way and a different approach. The thing that's powerful and interesting about Neville Goddard is is this was talked about long ago. So to give you some background on Neville Goddard, he, it's the weirdest thing, you know, he doesn't have a page on Wikipedia, like it was removed. I don't know why, but Neville Goddard, they, you know, he was considered a prophet, influential teacher and, and, and an author. He never described himself as a metaphysician or um, any is sided with any isms or new thought ta- teachings. He explained that his purpose was to illustrate the teachings of psychological truth intended in biblical teachings and restore awareness of meaning what, to what ancients intended to tell the world. Now, the interesting thing about Neville Goddard is he has taken the Bible and changed it completely from the way that you'll ever look at it again. A lot of people may be opposed. There may be resistance to some of his work because he does mention the Bible a lot. People that are particularly against any sort of mentions of the Bible sometimes tend to hear Neville God, not understand where he's coming from. Understand, he is showing how the Bible proves the law of attraction. And when you start to hear his teachings of the Bible, his use of different biblical scriptures is amazing. He was born in 1905, 1972. He became a U.S. citizen. And at one point, they had drafted him into the war in World War II. And he was 38. And he be- he believes through his power of imagination that he was able to, because he didn't want to serve in the military, that he was able to, you know, and he had a wife and daughter at home. And so he used this and he was able to get honorably discharged and brought his message to the United States. He was also able to become a citizen. And Goddard's interest in esoteric interpretations of the Bible and his teachings really deepened when he met this person named Abdullah. 
Abdullah is popular in the, the mythology of Neville Goddard because he brought a lot of the knowledge that Neville Goddard uses. Uh, he's described as an Ethiopian Jew who lectured in, on esoteric Christianity and taught both Goddard and Joseph Murphy. And Joseph Murphy's the writer of The Power of the Subconscious. So I would love to find out if Abdullah has ever, does have, I think he does, but I, you know, to his own writings and see if he's got anything that would be interesting for me to read. Neville went to hear him somewhat under protest to satisfy the constant urging of a friend saying, I recall the first night I met Abdullah, I had purposely delayed going to one of his meetings because a man whose judgment I did not trust had insisted on my attendance. And at the end of the meeting, Abdullah approached Goddard and said, the brothers told me that you would be here six months ago. And then he added, I'll remain until you have received all that I must give you. Then I will depart. And he, according to Goddard, may have been waiting to die to teach Goddard because he was long to go to this next world. And he learned Hebrew and Kabbalah and hidden symbolic meaning of scripture. Now, I would love to know if Goddard has discussed the Kabbalah. If anybody has any any lectures or anything like that, I'll, I'll have to look it up. I haven't looked that up. It'd be very interesting. But Neville eventually made his home in Los Angeles, where in the 50s, he gave a series of talks on television and radio and for many years lectured regularly to capacity audiences at the Wilshire Ebel Theater. In the 60s and early 70s, he confined most of his lectures to Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. In his early lectures and books, Neville dealt solely with what he called the law, which is to me the law of attraction, but the, the technique of creating one's physical reality through imagining. It is this portion of his expression that most closely accords with the teachings of the New Thought Movement. In describing the law, Neville related how he made a sea voyage from New York to see his family in Barbados during the Depression without any money of his own. And I'll, and I'll read that story to you here in a second. He related how, by the use of imaginal power, he was honorably discharged from the military service. And he gave his audiences in San Francisco in the 50s and 60s accounts of how others had made use of the law. Uh, he discussed it on television in the Los Angeles area, saying, Learn how to use your imaginal power, loving on behalf of others, for man is moving into a world where everything is subject to his imaginal power. Then the, there's a, the next, in the year of 1959, he began to experience what he called the promise. Now, this particular part of Neville Goddard is very interesting. I don't see as much description of that in the Neville Goddard board. So what is the promise? I still don't totally understand. He later wrote, I did not know of the promise until I began to experience it and have it unfold within me beginning that summer and continuing during the next three and one half years. And this is scriptural. Read it in the book of Daniel, where it is referred to as time times and a half. It comes to 1260 days in your experience of it. So supposedly we are all supposed to undergo something called the promise, which is a 1260 days. If anybody knows more about this, I will see if I can learn more, but it's, it's interesting. In the latter part of the 60s, that's what he was, uh, in, in the 70s, Neville, Neville gave more emphasis to the promise over the law. One could use imaginal power to change one's circumstances, he said, but it would be temporary and will vanish like smoke. He went on to explain that the promise superseded the law, claiming, oh, you can use it to make a fortune, to become known in the world, all these things are done, but your true purpose is here to fulfill scripture. After subordinating the law to the promise, he became as eager to hear accounts of those who had experienced the promise and sharing such accounts as he had earlier of those with the law. His theological view of the promise includes both the cosmology of union with Godhead after death and feature restoration for those who do not accept the promise during their lives. Of the promise, he said, you do not earn it. It is a gift. It is all grace. God's promise is unconditional. God's law is unconditional. And it comes in its own good time. If you do not experience it in this life, he said, you pass through a door that's 
all that death is and you're restored to life instantly in, in a world like this, just this world. And you go on there with the same problems you had with no loss of identity. Not old, not blind, not crippled. If you depart this life that way, but young, in this restorationist afterlife, he said of people there, they grow, they marry, and they die there too with all the fear of death that we have here. And if they die there without experiencing the promise, they are restored to life again and again and again in a place best suited to the work yet to be done in them. And it continues until Christ be formed in you. And as sons of the resurrection, you leave the world of death never to enter it again. Interesting. So in response to questions about the fear of eternal hell and damnation that many have, Neville would reply with a, quick, with a quote from Scripture, not one shall be lost in all my holy mountain. You are God, and how could God could eternally condemn himself? Wow. Until we awaken and make this discovery, he said, we are privileged to use a law given by God to cushion the blows of life. The law, stated succinctly, is this. In Neville words, imagining creates reality. In the last years of his life, he said, I know my time is short. I've finished the work I've been sent to do, and I am now eager to depart. I know I will not appear in this three-dimensional world again, for the promise has been fulfilled in me. As for where I go, I will know you there as I have known you here, for we are all brothers infinitely in love with each other. And so he died at the age of 67, just a few months after I was born. <laughs> One month after I was born, which I find interesting. But... I just think that his story is interesting. It tells you a little bit about what happened with Neville Goddard. But he is an incredibly good speaker. And I wanted to give you some of his lessons on how to use your imagination. And at the end, a short little meditation that you can use if you want. If you want a short little meditation, the way he discusses it. And I'll, I'll just do a little bit, a little tiny one at the end. So the purpose of his discussion was to show how to use your imagination to achieve your every desire. And as he said, most men are totally unaware of the creative power of imagination and invariably bow before the dictates of facts and accept life on the basis of the world without. But when you discover this creative power within yourself, Goddard would say, you will boldly assert the supremacy of imagination and put all things in subjection to it. And when a man speaks of God in man, he is completely unaware that this power called God in man is man's imagination. This is the creative power in man. There is nothing under heaven that is not plastic as potter's clay to the touch of the shaping spirit of imagination. Neville tells a story that once a man said to him, you know, Neville, I love to listen to you talk about imagination. But, but as I do so, I invariably touch the chair with my fingers and push my feet into the rug just to keep my sense of reality and the profundity of things. Well, undoubtedly, he is still touching the chair with his fingers and pushing his feet into the rug. In many ways, I think that when Neville mentions this, it's almost like he's inducing trance. It sounds like an NLP trance induction when he says that. He goes on to say, well, let me tell you another one who didn't touch with her fingers and didn't push that foot of hers into the board of the streetcar. It's the story of a young girl. Now, this story is my favorite story of basic Neville Goddard, and it's a story that I want you to embrace and start to use because Locked in this story is the secret to everything. You're going to have crazy bad things happen to you. And in this story is the secret to change everything, to rewrite, to rescript, to find an advantage in anything. This is just such a powerful story. And so it's the story of a young girl. She just turned 17 years old. And basically it was Christmas Eve. And she is so sad of heart. Her heart is just sad. Because for that year, she had lost her father in an accident. And she's returning home to what felt like an empty house. She had not been trained to really do anything. And so she had gone out 
got herself a job as a waitress. And the night was late. And it was Christmas Eve and her father was gone. And it's raining. And she's in a car full of laughing boys and girls. Home for their Christmas vacation. And she couldn't conceal the tears that began to stream down her face. Luckily for her, it was raining, as, as Ed Goddard explained. So she stuck her face into the heavens to mingle her tears with the rain. So she's crying, and she looks up, and it's raining. And then holding the rail of the streetcar, this is what she did. She closed her eyes, and she said, this is not rain. This is spray from the ocean. And this is not the salt of tears that I taste. For this is the salt of the sea in the wind. And this is not San Diego. This is a ship. And I'm coming home into the Bay of Samoa. And there... In that moment, she felt the reality of all that she had imagined. She felt it. So she came to the end of her journey and they got out of the car. Ten days later, this girl receives a letter from a firm in Chicago saying that her aunt, several years before, when she sailed for Europe, deposited with them $3,000, which back then is a lot more than $3,000, maybe $30,000 more. And she gave instructions that if she did not return to America, that this money would be paid to her niece. They had just received the information of the aunt's death and now acting upon her instructions, one month later, this girl sailed for Samoa. As she came into the bay, it was late night and there was salt of the sea in the wind and it wasn't raining but there was a spray in the air and she felt what she had felt the month before it felt exactly the same only this time she had realized her objective just think about that for a second and I want you to take this lesson And I want you to be able to, if you have some moment that you're in, I want you to be able to take that moment and turn it into something else. Whatever it is, use your imagination. Your imagination is going to give you an alternative. Stop. Try to completely change your reality in that moment and imagine whatever you're going through. If you taste the salt, then turn it into the spray of the ocean. And there could be many different examples of that. But you can do that. You can take something that's happening negative around you. Close your eyes. And with your imagination, turn it into something that you're experiencing in that moment. That you would like to experience in the future. But make it in that moment completely. This is a technique. And Neville wanted to show you how to put your wonderful imagination right into the feeling of your wish fulfilled and let it remain there and fall asleep in that state. This is something that he advises for his imagination powers, imagination technique, is that you imagine the wish fulfilled as you fall asleep. And I promise you, from my own experience, you will realize the state in which you sleep. If you could feel, actually feel yourself right into the situation of your fulfilled desire, and continue therein until you fall asleep as you feel yourself right into it remain in it until you give it all the tones of reality until you give it all the sensory vividness of reality and as you do it in that state quietly fall asleep 
in a, in a way you will never know. You can never consciously devise the means that would be employed. You'll find yourself moving across a series of events leading you towards the objective realization of this state. From what we know now, it could be very possible that her aunt never had done that. She had moved into a reality where her aunt had left money for her simply by using the power of her imagination. Imagine that. So here's the practical technique. The first thing you do, you must know exactly what you want in this world. Now, I hate to use the word want. That's the words that Neville Goddard is using. When you know exactly what you want, make as lifelike a representation as possible of what you would see and what you would touch and what you would do were you physically present and physically moving in such a state. I'm reminded of Frederick Dotson, who also emphasized that he teaches the feeling in your body and he actually f- teaches for you to learn how to walk and move your body around as if that's how your body would feel in that state. And that's what Goddard is saying right there. For example, now this is a great example. I get a lot of people that, that, that message me with a similar situation. So listen closely. For example, suppose I wanted a home, but I had no money. I meet people all the time that want to get a home. They don't have any money. They have bad credit, whatever. All right. And they literally, in their hearts, give up because they don't think it's possible. So let's follow what Neville Goddard says. Suppose you want a home, but you had no money, but you still know what you want. Now, without taking anything into consideration, you would make as lifelike a representation of the home that you would like with all the things in it that you would want. And then... This night, as you go to bed, you would in a state, a drowsy, sleepy state, the state that borders upon sleep, you would imagine that you're actually in such a house that were you to step off the bed, you would step upon the floor of that house. Were you to leave this room, you would enter the room that is adjacent to your imagined room in that house. And while you are touching the furniture and feeling it to be solidly real, and while you are moving from one room to the other in your imaginary house, you would go sound asleep in that state. And you know that in a way you could not consciously devise you would realize your house. Goddard has claimed that this has worked time and time again. And of course, we see examples all the time now in the, in, in the secret, in law of attraction community. This is a story that's time been told time and time again. If you wanted promotion in your business, you would ask yourself, what additional responsibilities would be yours? Were you given this great promotion What would you do? What would you say? What would you see? How would you act? And then in your imagination, you begin to see, touch, do and act as you would outwardly see and touch and act. Were you in that position? If you now desired the mate of your life, Were you now in search of some wonderful girl or wonderful man? What would you actually find yourself doing that would imply that you have found your state? For instance, suppose now you were a lady. One thing you definitely would do. You would wear a wedding ring. So you would take your imaginary hands and you would feel the ring that you would imagine to be there. And you would keep on feeling it until it seemed to be solidly real. You would give it all the sensory vividness that you're capable of giving anything. And while you're feeling this imaginary real link, which implies that you're already married, you would go to sleep. Those are two great examples. He validates this with the story in the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. It is said, At night on my bed, 
I sought him whom my soul loveth. I found him whom my soul loveth, and I would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house, right into the chamber of her that conceived me. If I would take that beautiful poem and put it into modern English, as Goddard says, into practical language, it would be this. While sitting in my chair, I would feel myself right into that situation of my fulfilled desire. And having felt myself into that state, I would not let it go. I would keep that mood alive, and in that mood, I would sleep. That is taking it right into my mother's chamber and into the mother of her conce- that conceived me. You know, people are totally unaware of this fantastic power of imagination. When I explain my podcast to people, I get glazed eyes. I mean, it, this is this is not super popular. Uh, these ideas are not super popular, but I believe them. And it is, I believe it's my responsibility to be of service, to bring these ideas, because it frustrates me. I see people that simply just don't, that lack the power of imagination. And that's all they need. When man begins to discover this power within him, Goddard says, he never plays the part that he formerly played. He doesn't turn back and become just a reflector of life. From here on, he is the affector of life. The secret of it, Goddard says, is to center your imagination in the feeling of the wish fulfilled and remain therein. For in our capacity to live, in the feeling of the wish fulfilled lies our capacity to live the more abundant life. Most of us are afraid to imagine ourselves as important and noble individuals, secure, in our contribution to the world just because at the very moment that we start our assumption reason and our senses deny the truth of our assumption we seem to be in the grip of an unconscious urge which makes us cling desperately to the world of familiar things and resist all that threatens to tear us away from the familiar and seemingly safe moorings Go and listen to the majority of Joe Dispenza's lectures, and he's talking about how we wake up and we have an imagined reality that we are already stuck into with our habits and our beliefs, and that we are afraid to move away from these, these unconscious, this un- unconscious thing that happens when we wake up. We have these programs that neurologically are built in, and he's giving an example that these things tear us away from that they, these things can pull us in and make it difficult for us to create a reality. I appeal you to try this. If you try it, you will discover this great wisdom. As Neville Goddard calls it, the great wisdom of the ancients. For they did it to us in their own strange, wonderful, symbolic form. But unfortunately, you and I misinterpreted their stories and took it for history. When they intended it as instruction to simply achieve our every objective. You see, imagination puts us inwardly in touch with the world of states of mind. Neville Goddard just calls them states. And these states are existent. They are present now. And they are mere possibilities while we think of them. But they become overpoweringly real when we think from them and dwell in them. It's a big distinction that he makes. We don't think of them. We think from them. Thinking from them implies it's already happened and we're having thoughts from them. Let me clarify that again. Think about it. They become overpoweringly real when we think from them and dwell in them. You know there's a wide difference between thinking of what you want in this world and thinking from what you want. Let me tell you when I first heard this strange and wonderful power of the imagination, Goddard says that it was in 1933 in New York City, an old friend of his taught it to him. So he gives us an explanation. He says he turned to the 14th of John and this is what he read. In my father's house are many mansions. 
if I were not so. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He explained to me, Goddard says, that this central character of the Gospels was human imagination, that mansion was not a place in some heavenly house, but simply my desire, if I would make a living representation of the state desired, and then enter that state and abide in that state, I would realize it. So Goddard says at the time he wanted to make a trip to the island of Barbados in the West Indies, but he had no money. So he explained that that night, as he slept in New York City, to assume the person he was talking to trained him said, assume that you're sleeping in your earthly father's house in Barbados and go sound asleep in that state that you would realize your trip. Well, Goddard says, I took him at his word and tried it for one month, night after night. As he fell asleep, I assumed I was sleeping in my father's home in Barbados. And at the end of my month, an invitation from my family came inviting me to spend the winter in Barbados. I sailed for Barbados the early part of December of that year. One of the best things that you can do when you close your eyes to go to sleep is imagine the bed you're sleeping in is somewhere else. If you want to go on a trip somewhere or you want to be in a different house or be somewhere else, it's the simplest, most easy thing that you can do. Just imagine as your eyes close that the bed you're in is not the bed in your house that you're in, that it's a bed in Maui or it's a bed in Europe or in France if that's what you want. That may not be what you want, but that is a terrific technique that I love. So from then on, Goddard says, he knew that he had found the the Savior in myself. The old man told me that it would never fail. Even after it happened, I could hardly believe that it would not have happened anyway. That's how strange this whole thing is. On reflection, it happened so naturally. You begin to feel or tell yourself, well, it would have happened anyway, and you quickly recover from this wonderful experience of yours. How many times have you seen manifestations happen for people or yourself? And people try to explain it away later. The mind tries to say, it wasn't my manifestations. It had nothing to do with me. It's just kind of one of those things that happened. It would have happened anyway. So it's ridiculous when people do that. But he's saying they've been doing that 70, 80 years now. But as Goddard said, it never failed him. If he would give the mood, the imagined mood, the sensory vividness, he could tell you unnumbered case histories to show you how it works. But in essence, it is simple. All of the lessons of reality creation are simple. One of the problems with reality transurfing is that it is so true and powerful, but it is complicated. There is some complexity to it. This is maybe resounds with more people on a larger scale because it's so simple. You simply know what you want. And when you know what you want, you are thinking of it. That is not enough. You must now begin to think from it. This is the emphasis that he has placed multiple times with capital letters. Thinking from it. Just like the reality and reality transurfing, this, the target slide it needs to be from a, that's already the wish fulfilled. It's almost as if he got the idea from Neville Goddard. You must now begin to think from it. Well, how could you think from it? You're sitting here and you desire to be elsewhere. How could you? While sitting here physically, put yourself in imagination at a point in space removed from this room and make that real to you. Quite easily, your imagination puts you in touch inwardly with that state. You imagine that you are actually where you desire to be. How can you tell that you're there? There's one way to prove that you are there. For what a man sees when he describes his world as he describes it relative to himself. So what the world looks like depends entirely upon where you stand and when you make observation. So if as you describe your world, it is related to that point in space, you imagine that you are occupying, then you must be there. 
You are not there physically, no, but you, I am there in imagination. You are there. And he says, I am. And my imagination is my real self. Your imagination is your real self. And where you go in imagination and make it real, what there you shall go in the flesh also. When in that state you feel, fall asleep, it is done. You've never seen it fail. So this is the simple technique upon how to use your imagination to realize your objective. Here is a very healthy and productive exercise for the imagination, something that you should do daily, according to Goddard. Daily, relive the day as you wish you had lived it, revising the scenes to make them conform to your ideals. This is a completely unrelated technique that we've then from what we've talked about earlier. It's still a part of the imagination, but it's very interesting. It's a time travel technique. It's a time travel technique. If you check out my time travel um, method, if you t- listen to Frederick Dotson or read his book, Parallel Reality of Self, same idea. But if you do this on a daily basis, you can see how this is pretty powerful. You daily relive the day as you wish you had lived it, revising the scenes to make them conform to your ideals. For instance, suppose today's mail brought disappointing news. Revise the letter, mentally rewrite it, and make it conform to the news you wish you had received. Or suppose that you didn't get the letter you wish you had received. Write yourself the letter and imagine that you received such a letter. He's giving examples of letters. People don't receive letters anymore. So imagine receiving emails and looking at the email. A lot, a lot more of my visualizations end up looking and visualizing computer screens. So there may be something else. Maybe... Maybe you could make yourself a promise that it's, if it's an important enough letter that you get it from email, that you're going to print it out and that you're going to read it so that you know when it does happen, you'll have it in your hand. And then you could, when it does happen, you print it out just in case so that you can have that. So there's a story that he says that took place in New York not very, in, in, in not very long ago from when he was telling this. And his audience set this lady who had heard him numerous times and was telling the story of revision that we just talked about Uh, that man not knowing the power of imagination he goes to sleep at the end of his day tired and exhausted accepting as final all the events of the day and he was trying to show that man should at the moment before he sleeps he should rewrite the entire day and make it conform to the day he wished he had experienced here is the way the lady wisely used this law of revision that he had taught it appears that two years ago she was ordered out of her daughter's law's home and for two years there she never was able to correspond with her daughter-in-law or her grandson and she had sent her grandson two dozen presents in that two-year period of time but not one was ever acknowledged having heard the story of revision she excitedly This is what she did. She retired at night. She mentally constructed two letters. One she imagined coming from her grandson and the other from her daughter-in-law. In In those letters, they expressed deep affection for her and wondered why she had not called to see them. She did this for seven consecutive nights. And I love it because it sounds like the time it took to create the world. So, you know, in seven days, holding her imagination, hand the letter she imagined she had received in reading these letters over and over until it aroused within her the satisfaction of having heard. Then she slept. And on the eighth day, she received a letter from her daughter-in-law. And on the inside, there were two letters. One from the grandson and one from the daughter-in-law. And they practically duplicated the imagery, the imaginary letters that this grandmother had written to herself eight days before. This art of revision revision can be used in any department of your life. Take the matter of health. Suppose you were ill. Bring your mind's eye the image of a friend. Put upon that face an expression which implies that he or she sees in you that which you want the whole world to see just imagine he is saying to you 
he has never seen you look better and you reply, I have never felt better. Suppose your foot was injured. Then do this. Construct mentally a drama which implies that you are walking, that you're doing all the things you would do if the foot was normal, and do it over and over until it takes on the tones of reality. Whenever you do in your imagination that which you would like to do in the outer world, then you will do in the outer world. The one requisite is to arouse your attention in a way and to such intensity that you become wholly absorbed in the revised action. So remember that the one requisite is to arouse your attention in a way and to such intensity that you become wholly absorbed in the revised action. You will experience an expansion and refinement of the senses by this imaginative exercise and eventually achieve vision in the inner world. The abundant life promised us is ours to enjoy now, but not until we have the sense of the creator as our imagination can we experience it. Persistent imagination centered in the feeling of the wish fulfilled is the secret of all successful operations according to Neville Goddard. Neville Goddard says this alone is the means of fulfilling the intention. He uses the word intention. Every stage of man's progress is made by conscious, voluntary exercise of the imagination. And then you will understand why all poets have stressed the importance of controlled, vivid imagination. And he find, ends his teaching with a quote from William Blake. In your own bosom, you bear your heaven and earth, and all you behold through it appears without. It is within, in your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. So you need to start learning how to imagine. Just start getting into a habit of daydreaming, something that Abraham really loves to talk about. One of the best things that you can do that is almost the same as meditation is daydreaming. Just daydream, daydream yourself doing the things that you want to do. Just just start daydreaming. So this, this had some interesting stories of imagining vividly, using the... the, the Things in your environment, the first story, the girl that tasted the salt and imagined that salty taste was from the spray of the ocean. The other one is when he mo- when he goes to Barbados, he just imagines in his bed that he's sleeping in Barbados. And the other one is the woman that revised the situation by imagining a letter that had been sent and revised. So what I'm going to do... Upon ending this is I'm going to create a separate meditation. It's going to be super short and it's going to be living in the wish fulfilled. And we're going to create a situation where you feel it in your body, you feel it in your mind, maybe 10 minutes. You can revise the day and then you simply daydream and imagine yourself in the wish fulfilled and you will slowly go off to sleep. So I hope that works out and just keep an eye out for it. I'll definitely be talking more about Neville Goddard because the reason it's it's so fascinating is he had some great techniques and concepts that he used in teaching these techniques and they are very effective and good and simplistic and just it's good to get a different perspective as we learn about this stuff. I want anybody that listens to all the episodes of the, of the Reality Revolution podcast to become a black belt in reality creation, to make this a mental martial art, as Owen Hunt referred to, as a way to deal with your daily life. And if you learn this, to learn the balance, learn to balance and understand importance and learn to visualize and all the different techniques we're talking about, you can have some incredible things happen. Anytime I find any techniques that I want to share with you that are easy and powerful, then I'll do it like I, as I did in this. And, and there's a bunch of Neville Goddard stuff. If there's anything out there about Neville Goddard that you want me to explore or do a meditation on, leave it in the notes. If there's any particular lectures that you would like me to go over with Neville Goddard, leave it in the notes because there's so many good ones. I'd be happy to explore those with you. In any case, I just want you to begin to use your imagination 
as much as you can for the life around you. Think freely and use this to live from the imagination, not on it. You must begin to think from it. That's all this is. It has been a joy. It has been a pleasure. I wish you the very best. For coaching, go to my website, advancedsuccessinstitute.com. For all episodes of The Reality Revolution, you can go to therealityrevolution.com. It is always a joy and a pleasure to share these teachings with you. And I wish you the very best as you go on about your day. Welcome to The Reality Revolution.